I really enjoy discussing cannabis specific content. However, today I really want to take it a step further and I want to look at what is required to set up a successful licensed business in the cannabis arena. Now, you may have heard of this GMP, good manufacturing practices that keeps getting spoken about, but we want to really unpack the utilities that support this process. And here we're going to focus on air handling units and clean air in clean rooms within the facility. To help me do this, we're going to invite Estian from Lucid Pharmaceutical on to really give us a comprehensive overview of the validation requirements, the installation requirements, and what is required to be successful as a cannabis license manufacturer. Hi, Estian. It's great to have you back. And today we're going to tackle some topics around air handling units, HVACs, you know, terms people don't really, people don't know that often or hear that often. So let's get into what is an air handling unit and how does that impact the air and the overall HVAC design of the facility? Hi, Jeff. Great to be back um, with you and your audience. I'm always happy to have a discussion. And um, yeah, let's get into it. So potentially an air handling unit um, is part of an HVAC system that drives or displaces the air through the ducting. So a lot of people get confused between an air handling unit and the actual HVAC unit. So an air handling unit just forms part of the actual HVAC, which is obviously heating, uh, ventilation, and air conditioning. So the air handling essentially drives your ventilation. It pushes the air through the ducting, and it normally either recirculates it or it brings back a efficient proportion um, of fresh air. So essentially it's your, um, if you want to put it in a more layman's term, it's your fan that essentially pushes the air through your ducting. Okay, awesome. And, and when it comes to, you know, the rationale behind it, because often we talk about the quality of the room and we're going to talk a little about requirements around clean rooms, but the intention here is obviously to focus on, you know, how does the, how many air changes or like in terms of maintaining the quality of rooms, how does the HVAC and the air, respective air handling units facilitate that? So when you look at the quality of your room, um, you have to look at the classification of the amount of particles in that room and additional testing, but particle count is one of the things that um, is used as a standard. So when you look at your HVAC, you need to um, ensure you've got the correct filters to, to make sure that your particle counts are correct. So for example, um, guidelines that you can you guys can have a look at here would be your, your WHO guidelines. You would look at your Annex 8 and Annex 2, which is part one and two of the HVAC guidelines. Um, they give a great description of, of the requirements and uh, the sort of particle counts that you're looking for in a grade B or ISO 7 and 8 facility. Um, you can also look at the actual ISO guideline, which is the ISO 14644. Um, one, which is your classification part of the, the um, you know, HVAC design. So yeah, it's absolutely important for you to consider every aspect, looking at your room quality, um, looking at the air quality coming in. Um, so depending on what, you, what sort of classification you want to get to, you have to put in the appropriate filters and the appropriate air pressures going into these rooms. Yeah, perfect. I mean, people might have heard of things like ISO 8 or grade D. So just to give some context for everyone, like an ISO 8 or grade D is usually like, there are more clean room grades. But when we talk about GMP, we really talk about an ISO 8 or grade D to start with. And then obviously ISO 8 goes down. So like it goes to an ISO 7, which becomes like a grade C. And then when we start talking air sterols, aseptics, we're talking about maybe a grade A area uh, with a background of a, maybe a grade 6, a grade, sorry, ISO 6 and 5, so 5 is like A, 6 is like B, and then that's kind of how you protect the product. And when we talk about protecting the product, I mean, and we talk about HVACs, let's get into um, the question around pressure cascades, because I think there's a lot of confusion often between, you know, what is the appropriate pressure cascade? You know, do you protect the corridor? Do you protect the rooms? Uh, maybe give me some views on, uh, you know, maybe other products, but also botanicals or herbal preparations. How do, what are the guidelines kind of indicated around the pressure cascade within a facility? Oh, it's a really good question, um, especially in your botanical industries. Um, just one thing I want to mention on the, on the ISO and the grading, it, it's very confusing. A lot of people come to me saying, you know, what's the difference between the grading and the actual ISO rating? The ISO essentially goes, like you mentioned, from grade one to grade nine. Um, but what, what X and the EU guidelines then did simplified for GMP is they made it grade A, B, C, and D. And then through that grading, you can essentially, um, you know, 
go into more specific details for the sort of ISO classification. Um, just, to, just to clear that up, because that's something I've found people ask me a lot. And with the pressure cascading, um, so you basically have two main principles. That's your, your negative pressure in your room or your positive pressure in your production rooms. So if you have a negative pressure in your room, it means that the pressure inside your room is less than the pressure on the outside. So the hallway would be overpressurized compared to your room, meaning that the air flows into your room um, from the hallway. And that's also called the clean corridor principle, um, where essentially you make sure that your cleaning procedures is written around your corridor. And you're obviously you need to make sure that in the room that you're you're adhering to your cleaning procedures, but the corridor is the primary point of contact for contaminants. But if you can keep that clean, you know, it's very easy to actually um, ensure that there's no cross-contamination or air particles or dirty particles moving into the production rooms. Other option, which you normally use for your liquid, um, is your, your positive pressure, your liquid and your sterile product. So you have a positive pressure in the room, meaning that the room is more highly pressurized than the hallway. So that is ideal for liquids and um, facilities that only has um, one product line, but there's no, you know, there's a lesser risk of cross-contamination. Um, so these sort of things, are, you know, you have to consider specifically on, based on the product that you're going to be manufacturing. Um, each and every one does have a different approach. The most important thing here is to sit and do a proper quality risk management um, meeting or um, sort of a uh, multidisciplinary team um, effort where you look at the, the different risks involved um, in the actual, well, specifically to the HVAC and to the product. Um, and then you can use that risk management to, to apply the appropriate principles to your product. Yeah, 100%. I mean, this comes back to the things like QBD, quality by design. Spend way more time in the design phase to make sure that you've allocated the rooms in the in the best flow and best design um, in terms of the air quality i mean absolutely like one thing i often see and i want to raise this point here is um sometimes guys under misunderstand the following which is if you're going to categorize an area let's just call it a grade d area um the more area you have under category d definition the more expensive it becomes which means you if you just spend time in design and you really minimize or you just make essentially the areas you need to have and the category D, you end up saving uh, on the air handling units, the HVAC design, the frequency of the HEPA filter replacements, uh, all those things contribute. Uh, it also makes it a little easier from a validation standpoint, because remember, you've got to test at rest and inactivity. Uh, and people often don't think about it. And then when you test in an activity, that's where you can sometimes have some problems because if you've maybe sized the room too small or you're not doing enough air changes, you, you start to see some problems occur there. Um, so it's a good point to raise there. But I want to bring up a question on the back of that, which is I often see facilities of air conditioners or air cons, like your standard office air con in these areas. You know, what is your view on that? I mean, it's probably appropriate for GACP, so no maybe issue around that. But in terms of a category rating, when I see, uh, instead of seeing HVACs and proper ducting, I see air-conditioned units in rooms. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. So, look, air conditioning um, can be sufficient in certain areas of your facility. Uh, when it comes to direct product contact, it is absolutely not recommended, especially at a GMP level um, and certain GACP products depending once again on what the risk is of your product um, and the risk of cross-contamination. The problem with the air conditioning that you have, that you don't have with the HVAC is you can't perform the necessary tests. Um, so there's no fault for testing, um, not, well, at least not a specific um, PMP standard, like the ISO standard. There's no fault for testing. There's no sort of um, room pressure testing, um, recovery tests, um, DOP tests. You can't do that with the air con. So, you won't necessarily get that classification level that you're required to have um, when you only have aircon. However, if it's a, let's say, for example, a secondary packaging room or a final dispatch area where you've seen, look, the product has already been covered by two layers of materials, it's been put in a box, there's no direct particle contact with the product, then you can say, look, um, we, looking at the risk assessment, we've Started that there's absolutely no risk to the product as long as we keep the temperature below a certain um, you know degree. So so we I mean it all depends on what you're doing in which areas, but product contact um, I would always recommend an HVAC. 
Yeah, I appreciate that because I think this has often been a, a discerning point where I've seen visits from facilities is I immediately pick it up and if I pick it up and auditor's going to pick it up, it's going to be a, you know, it's not a traditional thing you see in GMP. It's what you see in like dispatch areas where it's appropriate, et cetera. So, you know, it also goes to that critical versus non-critical personnel. But uh, I just want to say thank you on this. Uh, and the one thing to end off with is, I mean, you kind of alluded to this when you compared the air cons with the HVAC unit around validation of HVACs. Um, you know, this is something that's often overlooked. So where do a team now has installed the proper HVAC? But then they, they maybe haven't gone around for the process of validating. Because when the auditor arrives, they often want to see, have you validated this HVAC? Can you tell us just quickly what that's about? So one thing I, I want to make clear, and, and a lot of clients ask me this is, or they say to me, look, we've got an HVAC, it's been validated. And then when I get to, to the site, you realize what they meant is it's been commissioned. So it's been installed and it's been commissioned by the company that actually installed the HVAC. That's the first part. You have to have um, HVAC installed correctly to the GMP specifications or GACB specifications, um, you know, for herbal medicinal products, depending on, on what you're going to be doing. But that is just the first part. So one, once you move over, you need to have a third party come in, come in and actually validate it. So what does that mean? It means that you have to have certain protocols in place, like, uh, for instance, the installation protocol. Um, for, so for your installation qualification, operational qualification of actual HVAC, all the specific design testing um, according to ISO 14644-3, um, which is your test methods that you use, um, they have to be validated to say, look, HVAC's been installed, that's, that's good and well, but does it perform to the required level um, that is required for DMP? And the only way you can prove that is by validating that. So you would either have an external company coming in to validate it, um, or you would do it internally through a, a, a team that you've selected to do so, um, which at least has to have two or three members, either from production and quality, um, you know, backgrounds. So and it's, uh, it's extensive process. Um, I mean, you have to test every single aspect of this. Um, one thing I would recommend um, your viewers is when you buy HVAC, try and get as much documentation um, alongside it. So look for things like IQ, OQ documentation. And so just to clarify there quickly, uh, before you continue, IQ OQ is installation qualification. So OQ is operational qualification. A PQ is normally the responsibility of you on the site doing a performance qualification. Yeah. But absolutely, this goes not only for, it goes for all equipment. So even when we start looking at, you know, how to go into the cultivation practices with uh, equipment, you know, you should be looking for IQ OQ as often as possible. But sorry to interrupt there. I'll let you continue with the uh, checklist of things to look for. No, no, you make a really good point because that is a query that comes up in a lot of the facilities that we see is, you know, um, we've got the equipment, but can we prove that it does what it's supposed to do? You know? and, yeah. and I think that's the same for the HVAC. So your, all your utilities, your HVAC and your RO is crucial. Um, all your equipment, as you mentioned, needs to be validated. So it's, it's a big difference between an installation um, and a manual that says it can do something compared to a validated piece of equipment or HVAC that actually performs like it should. Uh, and once again, make sure that it's done by a qualified external company. Yeah, and that external company has actually calibration certificates for what they use to actually do it. So you've got to do a, pre a full kind of service level assessment here of the, of the suppliers and the audit. Who you, you've got to audit them as well, just like you would be audited. So awesome. Estian, I want to say thank you because that we're going to have a couple more conversations down these routes. I mean, for me, the risks to a facility is the air. So we've kind of touched on that. It's the process flow and facility flow, which I know we'll be touching on. It's things like the water quality going into that facility. So we'll talk on that. It's about the personnel, PPE, all of that. So if we tick off these aspects in short videos, I hope it helps everyone in terms of understanding the requirements about, you know, how to approach GMP, not only for botanical preparations, but for just general pharmaceuticals or products. And, and the same could be said to, to food grade facilities. So all these considerations filter through. So Estian, thank you so much for your time. Now, if you enjoyed that interview, be sure to also check out the interview I did with Estian on GACP, Good Agricultural and Collection Practices, and its migration to GMP and the associated relevant frameworks in the link attached.